Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Physical layers that make something do. You, we don't have that world where you can build your own stuff now. If your TV went bad and you were trained in it, you could actually unscrew the back of the television set yourself, yeah. program, and find the bad part. Um, even even um, people who knew nothing about technology and technology is a lot of housewives, they would take out the tubes, vacuum tubes, out of their television set, run down to the Safeway grocery store, or whatever it was called back then, lucky. And they would plug them into a machine and test them, find the bad one. This was a common part of life. You'd bring the good one back, plug it back into your television, and now it worked. So people did a lot of self-repair in those days. You could also put your vacuum cleaner in a closet and protect it, and it would never change. It would work for 40 years, do the same thing well. Nowadays, <laughs> <laughs> you know, every two years, whatever you have, doesn't seem to work because of some little change. It's a little and it, especially when it's out in the cloud, you don't have any control. They'll just change over the, they'll remove a feature that you depended on. Yeah. But before the Apple one, computer day, what was the big breakthrough with Apple <laughs> Before it was all just numbers and you had to type in, but what was the breakthrough that you wanted? More user interface and be able well, to... Computer technology was understood in terms of the elements inside a computer and the sort of programs the computer understood. And they aren't like the programs you get taught in most schools. Machine language it was called. Little ones and zeros and exactly what they did. That was understood and how computers had been built in the past. But they all had these horrible looks, tons of buttons and lights, and you'd walk up to them and say, unless I am educated in this stuff, I'm a computer expert, I can't touch this machine, I can't use it. And then we had a group of people that were really inspired by social um, socials, um, philosophy, so social and social um, um, psychology professors from Stanford and Berkeley talking about how once we owned our own computers, it would be a great new world, and that inspired me so much. I had the talent to make some things I thought of. One of the important ones was, it has to be usable by you. Well, first of all, it has to be human. You don't want a big old front panel full of switches and lights. You want a typewriter and a little display on your TV set. That's like a typewriter. Humans could relate to that. So that was step number one. But second of all, you wanted people to be creative. Steve Jobs used the phrase, the bicycle of the mind, because the bicycle is what gave man the energy to distance ratio that was better than any other animal. It was a bicycle. If we had a computer, we could now create tools that would get us further than ever before. Tools in the music business are an example, you know, pro tools and all. And, and the bicycle of the mind. So, um, so anyway, I don't know what, what topic we were on. <laughs> Well, I think it was an issue. this is one of the things that we were thinking about. The, the change in music industry has evolved to the point where someone with very little music uh, training can have a hit record. Yeah. And that makes some serious musicians who have spent their whole life perfecting their craft uncomfortable. And you took computers, which had before then only been used by people who were really dedicated and knew the code, to a, a box that out of the, you opened up an Apple II and it worked. And anyone can use it. How did that change? Did the, those first generation feel marginalized? So well, musicians today feel... Well, my, my biggest motivation of all the Apple II was video games. I love humor, I love fun in life, anything you do. And I had even designed video games for Atari. It was a hard, hard project to design games in hardware. I wanted a machine that you could sit down and half a day write a really good animated um, program. Your own, game. Yes, your own game. And then a 10 year old could, written in a simple little language like basic. And I strive and strive and achieve that goal. So making it simple to do was a, was a big goal. Big and great. anybody could do it, because now you have a tool that you can execute your, your own creativity. Yeah. You were talking about each one of these breakthroughs, it's at the point where you can never go back. You know, we were talking about black and white and color. We were talking about how these screens when we first started with a couple of speakers. Yeah, the one way door in technology, technology, things like even a mouse based computer, once you go through that door, you know you aren't going to go back to. I'm going to memorize a whole bunch of commands, or I'm going to hit the forward arrow key eight times and the down arrow three times to get to the letter I want. You know, you're never going to go back. So the one-way doors are always the ones that somehow technology is propelling us in this direction. Are we in control of it? Is it coming from our minds, or is it the technology is causing us to create it? Is it just a, like a subject of a type of mathematics that we are going to stumble on? This is the direction we're going to go. We don't know it in advance. Yeah. We just sort of discover it rather than create it. And someday the technology's not there to be smart enough to tell us the answer yet. Well, as Baker as well said, that point will come. At some point, those two intersecting, intersecting lines, you know, singularity. In the singularity. Yeah, I really just stayed that my whole life. Computers will never be like a human brain. 
first program I wrote was a chess problem and didn't solve it, and then I calculated it wasn't going to have a solution for 10 to the 25th years. A computer, a computer can do things really fast, a million times a second, but the human brain has intuition and can think out how to solve the problem, and the computers haven't gotten to that stage yet, and it'll never happen, and the singularity idea came out. Computers will be able to process as much intelligence as the human brain 20 years from now, and I said, for what a bunch of baloney that never will. And then I start thinking about it. I said, oh my gosh, all the methods of predicting that 20 year point are the right way to predict things. Exponential curves of information usage and its size and its density and its cost. Oh my gosh. And I came around saying, yes, computers are going to be fully conscious in 20 years. And the trouble is, after I said it enough times, what does it mean is so negative? A computer that can think 100 times faster than a human. You know, it's just like the movie Her. That's what I came to the conclusion of before I saw the movie. So I, I had to find a reason to say it won't happen. So I'm hoping that computers won't become quite as intelligent as humans because we're at the end of how much smarter we can make our devices, our smartphones and all. We're at the end of it because Moore's law is a law of physics that says how much smarter can you make your devices every year, how many more electronic neurons can you put on silicon, and I think we're near the end of it for some good reasons that I have, but um, let's hope. Let's hope. I mean, hey, man, I was going to say, if we're going to be the, if we're going to be the family tech building all this equipment to take care of us, and now it takes care of us, and we have to almost do nothing, you know, maybe you're at the top of the money chain or the bottom, but um, you do almost nothing, you're taken care of for life, we're like the family pet. And when I got that idea about three years ago, I started feeding, I started feeding my boss to lay steak every night. We <laughs> <laughs> have the others. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't see that one coming, but uh, yeah. one, thing, one thing I like about music groups too is that they have a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they like humor, they have prank stories. And well, you a little bit of misbehavior leads to pretty good wine. You ran into a half dozen man. A half dozen man in the I think you came this morning and run into a half ghost man who looked a little dry. I'm not sure if he was like on the way to the session or on the way home from something last night. I couldn't have been either. <laughs> well, instantly I asked him, oh, which floor is the laundry on? <laughs> he wasn't wearing a shirt, so he gave me his shirt laundry. Clearly, he's going for it. <laughs> but he didn't quite laugh at me. I think it might have been a long night. <laughs> this, this thing possibility. Um, so, we're talking about a lot of young people here today. And they're, they're looking for inspiration of where to go. We've got a lot of our NAM members who are also in their careers and looking for inspiration. Sometimes moving through the challenges of today can be daunting. And I want to talk about your process as you went through some of these major breakthroughs in your life. How you took it step by step. Can you walk us through how you your approach to solving some of those challenges of building the Apple One or Two? Try to do it quickly, but starting in elementary school of actually building projects that were like graduate level you know, courses in the university, especially back then. I mean, even when I got to college, it was a graduate course, Introduction to Computers, graduate level course. So this was, somehow I stumbled onto it accidentally, finding a journal and saying, oh my gosh, these computers, ones and zeros, are easy for a fifth grader to understand. You don't need to understand higher level mathematics and calculus like the way you design televisions. Oh my gosh, I love that stuff. I love being special, but I didn't do it with any single any friends or anyone. No, we didn't have this in school. This is not stuff that's taught in school. Most of the valuable things for your career and your work life aren't taught in school. I don't know why. You have to learn them on your own. But the teachers, if they do them, they'd probably be doing those things, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I want to produce a book of all the teachers here today. <laughs> I'm the one who started these companies with no degree at all, and I'm the one who actually went back under a fake name at Berkeley, and I got my degree, and the diploma has the fake name on it. Rocky Raccoon Clark. <laughs> Your class and your books and your backpack. Yeah, this was after Apple, so I had to use a fake name, you know, because I didn't want people saying, oh my god, the guy who started Apple isn't even getting any pluses. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Good, Mom. What chance do I have? <laughs> I go back 10 years later. But no, but I had high education values. I thought this is really the most important factor of the, your future in life, but really the education you get walking on the streets or anywhere, you know, just talking to people, thinking out ideas reading books, you know, you get it so many ways in life, and the ones that really pertain to a career usually come from other places. 
um, you know, sure, yeah, we have, thank God we have music, you know, and arts and schools all over California. In California, we're about 50th in the nation. Class size, we're 50th in the nation, far from Mississippi. So anyway, don't get me rolling on education. We're, we're here with fun, fun crap. But the idea that when you uh, <laughs> Yeah, you, bring, you bring a little bit of humor into a classroom these days, man, you get full of all sorts of things, including your bad for school, you're disruptive and you're not smart anymore. You're offending somebody probably, right? Oh. But the idea of, um, you know, you, you look at this process and said, okay, I've got a problem. And you solved that one, and then you went to the next one. And you didn't really think about it in a whole totalitarian subject, because it might have been daunting then, but you took it a step at a time. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what you're saying, but I would often talk to <laughs> into a circuit that happens to add numbers. Yeah, it was a long growing process up. And also when you design a program, some program, you have an end goal. I will solve this part of it kind of at an outer level and I'll solve this for smaller parts and individual little things. And it winds up in the end, it's like music because it's like you've learned, you've got notes and you can find notes into chords and chords into little, you know, you get into bars and you get into a whole song. But you work your way up quite a bit. And it's very, very similar in that way. And I found that the best engineers, the bright ones, the really creative artists that can create an entire new product category at Apple, they always had a strong music background. You know, they made so much Because I played guitar for 20 years, but I was not musically trained. I didn't know notes and all that. I just did it by ear and it sounded pretty. I did it for myself. I never played in front of other people even. But um, so I was, I felt low on the scale, but yeah. Uh, the, the brilliant person that really made computers easy to use today more than anyone else in the world, and he was an influence on Steve Jobs and myself, Jeff Raskin. He taught classical music at UC San Diego also, and then joined Apple, and he was in control of, of the decision making of every feature in a product, could go in or couldn't go in, depending on whether it was explainable in a manual. <laughs> and so that was, that was a really good step back and took that nobody really saw back in the Apple II days. Yeah. But the artist side of it, they're creators, and that's what I think is what uni unifies all these industries is the creative artist part. You felt like an artist, putting chips together in a sequence that was very artistic. It's never been done this way before. You know? Yeah, right. oh, I had technique after technique after technique to design things in a way nobody else did. Yeah, I was even known for it. Hewlett Packard, we were designing the calculators, the iPhone 6 over the day, and, and it, 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 the PhDs over at HP Labs needed a problem solved with fewer parts. They call our division and have me work on it. <laughs> but I like simplicity in life. Um, I would normally not have even worn a suit here today. But you know what? One of my rules of simplicity, I call them bachelor rules, is well, if you can wear your, your underwear and your socks for two weeks, you don't have to launder as much, right? <laughs> but, but, you, but whatever you wore yesterday, you wear it again the next day. So last night I was at the Magic Castle and you had to wear a suit and tie, so here I am. <laughs> How long their hair is, you know, what they're wearing it shouldn't matter, you know. Growing up during the Vietnam War was, you know, how long your hair is. You get, you know, some people would just treat you like, oh, you must be on drugs, you know. 60s, the counterculture movement in the Bay Area, you're on drugs, or you're, you know, and, and it was just a wrong way to look at people. You know, look at the human, judging people. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Um, so advice for, you talk about some of the advice for engineers, and I guess that would transfer over to anyone in the creative process about when that initial process starts, work alone. Don't try and solve things by committee. I don't know, but I would like to give advice to everybody. You know what, because everybody who's creative has different methods of working. And if you are with a partner that thinks just like you, that's the best thing. I talked about my wife's here somewhere. Um, that is the best thing you can ever find in the world if you like into it. But if you, no, I was shy, and people didn't talk to me in school. I was such a nerd. I had no chance of a girlfriend, which gave me a lot of extra time. <laughs> <laughs> but I would sit down. I would have a concept of something I could build. I'd sit on paper with a pen and start drawing the pieces that could work together. And then I'd actually get the pieces and solder them at night and put them together. And for five years leading up to that, well, I was building many, many projects. And, and about and every time, about once a year, Steve Jobs would come into town, 
and see what the latest thing I built was for fun, and he'd find a way to turn it into money. <laughs> we actually were just were formalizing what we've been doing for five years as a partnership. We were just making it real. Yeah. yeah, you need both of those, right? I mean, you need someone who can take those ideas. Oh, my gosh. I was, I was a designer, like somebody who could create music, but then there's a packaging need. You know, you need to get all the, the thrills around. Like, if you could paint a great painting, then you need somebody that puts it in a beautiful frame and puts it in a gallery and sells it. So, so you still need the business side of things, and you need motivation, you need want. I wanted the computers for myself. Steve Jobs wanted a company, wanted to be important in the world someday. And it took him a long time to find it, but he found it. <laughs> but the idea is, so, the other examples of <laughs> when a committee was involved in Apple, where things just didn't go right. Apple three, maybe, is there something where... Example, oh, the, the Apple three was such a good specific one. Oh my gosh. We, when we started Apple, the Apple II had come totally from me. I had a, the Apple II and the Apple I totally built before Steve Jobs even saw them. Before we had an idea for a company, they weren't not designed as products, they were designed to move the world forward healthy social goals of communication and education and the geek being important, that's what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they came from an engineering background. Hewlett Packard, where I worked, was an engineering driven company back then. Why? Because we only made products for engineers to use as test equipment. Well, um, well, what happened was when we started Apple, our funder, who owned as much of the company as Steve Jobs and me, and he was really the mentor that told us, here are the people you hired to set up a technology company, Here's what their roles and responsibilities are. Here's what you'll do. Here's what Steve will do. Um, uh, he, he's, he don't own as much as You never hear about him because he had us get an agency to define our company. And then it was kind of a myth of a garage of two kids coming from nowhere. It's sort of an exciting story, like, like, like Mark Zuckerberg in a dorm room actually creating stuff, you know? It's that level of story. So, uh, and I forget where I was, where we were. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I don't mind. I know. I see that. I guess. Uh, <laughs> So the idea that when, when it didn't go well, all of a sudden, because you had yeah, the Apple products three, The Apple three. So we were going to, Mike Markula, our funder, said, you have to be a marketing-driven company that understands the people who are going to use your product. And I totally bought into it from that day to this day. You have to understand their, their, their wants or needs, what the price point should be, and, and how to build the right products, and what's good and what's bad. And marketing-driven. Marketing, but then the concept of marketing is the business side. They come up with the ideas for the product and tell engineering to build it like engineering is just a resource you can buy. They didn't look for the artist engineers like me. It's just engineering can be done. And on the Apple III, it was very strange. You have, a computer is worth nothing without software. You want a solution to problems, and it's hard work with software, a computer and a program. And um, so the thing is, we had the Apple II was selling thousands of programs, selling all over the world, these revenues pouring into the company. But we saw the market is more business. They're buying our truck, our computer, and plugging boards in that give it more capability. We'll build that computer with more capability in it and call it the Apple III. And when you booted it up, there was one switch. If you put the switch up and you turn the computer on, it came up as an Apple III. If you put the switch down, it came up as an Apple II, and it could run all the thousands of programs. Okay? But a marketing came to engineering and said we had to put extra chips in the product, extra money, extra parts to disable the features that the business users wanted when it booted up as an Apple II. So that people would think Apple II is only for games. What a horrible mistake, because that was Apple III had all sorts of problems and it couldn't get developed. It didn't get, you know, it was a good computer, but it didn't get into the market quickly because it didn't have software. And the people wouldn't buy the Apple II because it wouldn't do their, their business needs because we put in chips to stop them. <laughs> you see that. And that was like, that's what we made horrible marketing errors over time. But you get away with it. Whenever you're a wealthy company and the market's growing and you're growing and you look good on paper, um, yeah, you can hide a lot of mistakes. You get a lot of restarts. You get a lot of chances to restart. So we were a lucky company. We started with a product, the Apple II, and it was going to be all the only money making product for Apple for the first 10 years of the company. One product is that good. You know, bringing color to humans, bringing color to the world. Nobody expected color in computers, for one thing. Nobody expected games to become software, and yeah. So, so it was it was such a huge advance. It really gave us the company. So at that point, you have a product last that long. It still is unprecedented, probably. That's something you stay in the market that no. long. Well, no, because you can keep names. You can keep names the same. Hewlett Packard had a calculator for financial types called the HP 25C, I think. Oh my gosh, that one went for 25 years, unchanged a bit. It was beautiful. Yeah. So, so you can design a product that is just so good and perfect for the audience that it lasts a long time. A lot of people may not know that you uh, you actually were a school teacher for a while, and it interested young people how they learn. 
You went back to work in the classroom on that. Yes, when I was in sixth grade, I told my dad, I'm going to be an electrical engineer like you. And boy, I had already proven myself in a lot of science fairs, uh, huge projects. And then I said, but my second goal is to be a fifth grade teacher like Miss Scrap. And, uh, and that stuck with me all through my life. Whenever I took college courses in psychology, understanding how mind develops, cognitive development, and, and young mind, and what they can do at different stages. Wow, I paid attention. It was like learning computer technology. I wanted to teach. I wanted to teach. Eventually, I had children. I had, was giving computers to schools. But you don't give computers. That's money. If you have a lot of money, giving money doesn't have meaning. You give yourself. So I decided, OK, I'll start teaching how to use the computer to get better grades, how to do better homework. Every subject in school, how can you apply it to a computer? And I started teaching fifth graders and wound up teaching up to full time, seven days a week. Fifth graders, sixth through ninth graders, teachers. I was teaching for eight years, no press allowed, because I didn't want press around young kids. They kept them all good. And they, they had adopted computers quickly and easily. You saw that in that generation? They, they found oh, the ab absolutely. In fact, I could scare me. I started seeing, oh my gosh, these computer kids are doing things you know, a different way than we ever did. And they're going faster than us. They're on the computer all day long in their little room. But I don't understand it, but it's right because progress has always got to be right. We're creating it. Yeah. Let's go on to the next topic. I think it's more about, again, our audience here in the music business. Um, I think it's easy to get overwhelmed with technology and music. Um, but you do think that this is moving us forward, unequivocally. Technology will always move us forward. Is that something well, you believe in? Well, I believe it when I was very young. My dad taught me. Engineers build the buildings and the bridges, and they build washing machines. They told me how our great-grandparents had to wash clothes by hand, and I thought, oh my god, we're so lucky to have these nice appliances. I want to be an engineer. I want to create this better, easier world. And that every time you develop something in engineering, you don't ever go back. It's one of those one-way doors. So it must have been the right good thing. It makes life easier and easier for us. And someday, my dad said, we might only have to work four days a week. And now it takes two people working full-time in a house, it's stressful jobs just to own a home in Silicon Valley, not even a home. Yeah, so, so we did, so we were successful in creating all this stuff that makes life easier, but we didn't somehow benefit wealth-wise from it. On the communication side, too, we are so late with communication, yet we still gather at places like this. Why is that so important, do you think? You um, I don't know. That's one of my formulas for happiness would apply. It was H, happiness equals FQ, food, fun, and friends. Food is a metaphor for the necessities of life. You can't be happy without food and system. Fun is entertainment, concerts, lunch festivals, and stuff like that. I came up with this after Steve Jobs said, you're not, a, you're not a, in the music business, you're in computers. And then friends. People matter so much to everything you do. Food, fun, and friends. And when I said that to my high school being inducted into the Hall of Fame, the kids started laughing, and I had to sit there at the microphone and say, oh, there might be a fourth F. <laughs> <laughs> MIDI. This was before MIDI. 
And then he hooked it up and wrote some software, joined, started a company because Apple didn't want to do it. And they actually had stuff where you could play a piano, piano keyboard connected to this card in the computer and it would know what keys you hit and how hard and then put the music. Eventually, a program would put the music on scales on your screen and eventually you could play one back and record another <coughs> sound on sound, you know, like uh, back to Les Paul days. And uh, uh, this was unbelievable to watch that happen and then MIDI came. Okay, this game over. <laughs> but it was kind of cool to see that evolution, how this computer technology was going to help these inventors create their stuff. And now you get a Pro Tools and anybody can have their studio wherever their laptop is, you know. Broadband. Right. So, yeah, broadband. Right. Broadband right. fits into that bicycle of the mind that you have to be Because you can use it to create. But Apple's kind of going downhill in the, um, the, the work tool, um, um, that type of computer use, you know, making video edits and all that, and you know, Google Packard's number one, and Yale is two, and we used to be number one in like video editing. But yeah, Apple sort of found that the consumer market is bigger. <laughs> you know, and I, I, I like the computer world myself, but there's a tablet world too. So, playing guitar, if you're gonna go buy some strings or look at maybe a new guitar, how would you approach it? Where would you start? Whoa, um, I don't know. I, the only way I would do is go down to the guitar center, you know, the guitar show business, go to a store, walk in, and look at all the beautiful and get inspired. And just by the look of something, it'll grab me. Certain things will grab me, you know. Might even be a GoPro or something I've never used before. I don't know. But so you need to go to the, you like to go to the store? Because I like to talk to some real humans when I don't know exactly what I want. Now, yes, if I find something exactly right, or I have a friend that's got this one model guitar or something like that, yeah, sure, I could just buy it online, I guess. You know, or, or <laughs> whatever. But I don't know. Uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> for, me, so for me, it was kind of lucky. And then after you get an instrument, you sit down and play some of the music you know, and it either sounds good to your ear, or it plays well, or it doesn't. Some of the guitars I bought just didn't have the sound that I liked. I could put, push the controls enough to get it and put in effects. So I would, you know, I had favorites. Yeah. But the idea of being able to say there's no one way. You you look at it online, you may do some research, you go to Gary Weinroth's store, guitar show pieces, all the kinds of ways you're going to want to find that product. You know? Yeah, but look on every stage, too. You see guitars of so many different shapes and styles, and some are outstanding in their design, they catch your attention in your eye. And, and so that means guitar is kind of like a little bit of an artistic element of a performer. And so that's why I look at guitars a lot that way, you know. Kind of reflects their own artistic personality. Yeah, like, I'd, like to, I'd like to see something in the, the shape, the design, the colors of it, and, you know, like the new Bob Dylan designed guitar. Mm -hmm. I just love the fact that with the color in it and the choices that he, he worked with them for six years and said, personally, that wasn't just even his name. Mm -hmm. So you think about all you've done, all you've seen, in particular, what are you most proud of when you look back? Well, you know, there's technical stuff, and I have to say, I'm most proud of the Apple II because of the great things that broke through. There were there were designs I did that I used my brain and came up with greater things, and one of them would have been the floppy disk for the Apple II, and another would have been even the blue box. Because I thought of ideas, and I love to take one little part and say it's doing one job, and I possibly use that part at the same time to do a second job and save a part, you know, simplicity, that whole mm -hmm. simplicity thing. And on the blue box, I swear I did one one thing where I made a couple pieces of one part of a chip do three things at once. Don't ask me how I did it. I even had the chip the chip sending the signals that would turn the chip on. Let's say to be clear, so Blue Box was illegal, <laughs> correct? Blue Box was illegal because it could make three calls That's by right. putting tones. So they're not encouraging that, kids. First of all, this one was illegal behavior, but it was illegal. <laughs> Brilliant. I also understood that I was young and you got talks at Blue Box and you kind of get slapped on the wrist. But, um, and I also never used the Blue Box to save money on phone calls. I used it to explore the phone system, convince London operator that I was a New York operator, and then I called the phone to <laughs> the phone and the norm will work, and you speak in one phone, and you hear the other one, and you have a Oh my gosh, this is fun, but I like to spread the phone what our business is doing in companies. I like to hang around interesting people out of interesting stories. The fact that you could put little beep, 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 beep into a phone and make calls um, was um, and anywhere in the world for free. That was just, who could believe it? You know? <laughs> <laughs> who could believe it? The and phone company probably couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that year in college, and I didn't do it after that, but um, you know, it was, wow. I had some 
credible experiences of typing in numbers and a phone number and listening to the FBI in San Francisco. I <laughs> call <laughs> about something, you know, they should not be overheard at all. I mean, did that kind of stuff, yeah. <laughs> Stars from a movie, fictional hero. Captain Crunch was a real guy. He got his name from a little whistle in Captain Crunch cereal that blew the exact note. It's the second harmonic of the high E string on a guitar that cuts off the long distance phone call, seizes the phone line, and now the phone company is listening to your tones to tell it where to dial. So he got to think, Captain Crunch, I love following him around in his escapade. Steve Jobs is afraid that, oh my God, no, what he's doing, he's going to get caught, he's going to get arrested, didn't want to hang around him. But I'd like to meet him every few months. What's the latest thing you've done that's so interesting? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, the night we met him, the FBI hadn't caught him yet. He was like one of the well-known phone freaks in, in nationally published stories that were going around. And somehow I stumbled onto where he was from, a high school friend, who he was, and he came to the dorms in Berkeley. I'd been spreading this more about phone freaks that were smarter than the phone company engineers taking over the networks of the world. And this guy, and then Captain Crunch was the hero, and he was going to come visit the dorm. I thought he was a suave guy because he talked about tapping the girlfriend's line and finding her career and her call another guy. And so he said, I thought I'd a suave, you know, ladies' man to come to the door, and the door stocks, and I open it up in the dorm. And here's this guy, he hasn't like shaved or, or showered in two weeks. He's missing three teeth. <laughs> Are you? I am he, Captain Crunch. <laughs> so he caused a lot of interesting phone calls that night up in Kick's Pizza Parlor in Berkeley. So they got, and Steve and I had to drive back home and Steve's car broke down, you know. We had to drive back an hour to, to Steve's house where my car was parked so I could drive back for school on Monday. So Steve's car breaks down, we, we're, we're by a, a gas company, we go to the payphone. Should we try the blue box on the payphone? Captain Crunch taught us how to do it. We tried and Steve jumps hung up real quick and he said, he said, the library came on the line. I said, we have to tell her the data call the light to flash and he does it again the, the, the light to flash and she comes to the line and he hangs up and he's all scared and then the cop car pulls in. <laughs> <laughs> and the cop, you know, walked right past us. I had long hair in those days and shone the light in the bushes like he's looking for something we might have thrown in there. You know? And while his back was turned, Steve managed to pass me the blue box because I had a coat on, I got it in the car. So pass us down. What's this? It's a little box that looks like a touch tone phone with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you know, the buttons for the dial calls. And I said, and every time you push one, it made a weird sound. I said, it's electronic music synthesizer, because the new synthesizer had just come out. It was in all the news companies. <laughs> <laughs> and the second gets the box, I said, it's electronic music synthesizer, and he'd say, what's the orange button for? And that's the one that seizes the phone line. Steve Jobs would say, that's for calibration. <laughs> They got in their car, we got in the back seat, they're going to drive us out to our broken down car, and cop reaches around, hands me back the blue box from the passenger seat, hands it to me, and he says, guy named Moon, beat you to it. <laughs> <laughs>
my life, I have always had very liberal philosophies, and even as a distribute of income distribution is my priority. So, I mean, the, some of your philosophies of life are so interesting about, you know, what's important and giving back. Talk a little bit about your blood, and you talk a little bit about the happiness part of all this, but how has that evolved? You've lived such a varied life, you've done so many different things, you've almost been able to live a dream life. Well, I've had 10 lives, I think, at least 10 lives, um, in different categories, us festivals and, and um, education, stuff like that. And I think, you know what, hey, if I die now, I did fine. I don't, so I don't worry about death. That's one thing. You know, everybody says, go to live long, get a maximized life. Hey, quality versus quantity. But quality is, how, quality is not how much you achieved and got done in the world. It's quality is how much fun you had, how much laughter. So I first want to for happiness in my life, or back when I was 20, was happiness equals smiles minus frowns, H equals F minus F. You maximize your smile by being a lot of humor, a lot of fun, make jokes, and you minimize the frowns by not caring so much if things go a certain way. You're not going to be upset. You're not going to be upset if, if your brand new car gets dead. And I'm that way. I just, you know, rule it out. You're not going to be upset if the wrong person gets elected. You know, so I just take life. <laughs> it's like a meditation. Your, your head is at a very cool spot all the time. You're not upset at things. That's a good way to be. I do get upset at certain things. When computer stuff doesn't work because the things humans humans put in that doesn't work the right way or misleads a human, that's I hate that. That's a problem. That's a problem. Yeah, every every little computer foul. Uh, yeah. well, well, you know, well, the thing is, the thing is, everything has a computer in it nowadays, right. and everything with a computer will break and stop working. And you know that you turn the power off, you turn it on, and it's in it. Well, I'll stop working. They should kill the people with brought us these computers. <laughs> <laughs> Love that it's working. <laughs> um, I have a personal question, because one of my heroes, and I never got to meet him, was, I think, the godfather of the modern concert experience. The really, the guy who made this whole idea of a big stage and, and, and rock, rock and roll where it was. Bill Graham. And you got to know him, you got to work with him. Any yep. insight as to what Bill was like? I'm just personally yeah. up here. Yeah, they, they asked me, did you have a band using technology growing up in Silicon Valley? Well, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area during those counterculture days, during the hippie days, all that. I would go to concerts. First concert I went to, really, the first real concert was um, Junior Walker playing that saxophone. Oh, I just died. Music would get right into your soul, it changed my life forever. And then after him was. Great was a uh, um, Jefferson airplane, and then Grateful Dead. I mean, what an experience! And Bill Graham would get up concert after concert. He'd get up on stage, you know, and I'd stay up all night long waiting for concert ticket purchase opportunities back in those days, not iPhones. And he'd get on stage and tell us all to get out to the the Emmy War um, march out in Golden Gate Park the next day and stuff like that. So I admired him when I was young, mm -hmm. and then got to work with him older on and stages for me and my festivals, my concerts, and then we put on. He knew that there was. He, at my US festival, I made the first video links ever to the Soviet Union. We used equipment that NBC had taken over to broadcast the Olympics. The United States pulled out of the Olympics in Moscow, but the equipment was there. And so these peace-oriented tech guys got the equipment, and we established a satellite link at our US festival. We played music, um, like Eddie Money, I think, was the first one. We sent to the Soviet Union, and they sent some back to us. On a, the first time ever, a big projection screen was used at a concert in the United States. It was my US festival. And it was wow. But Bill Graham, Bill Graham didn't think it was real. He didn't go up to announce it. A microphone on the stage. So I ran across the stage and he looked at a couple of monitors and said, Steve, this is coming from a Southern California studio. The Soviets would never let you do this. <laughs> and so I ended up with a microphone and announced it. Back then, it was old war. It wasn't even perestroika. And he said, oh my gosh, we got a connection to the Soviet Union. That's like Al Qaeda. <laughs> and uh, so it got booed a bit, but um, we did it. It was, important, it was an important step. Later on, years later, Bill called me. He said he got a rare opportunity to put on the first concert in the Soviet Union with a bunch of American groups and a bunch of Soviet groups together. And a couple of American groups had gotten over there. Billy Joel and somebody else, I think, had gotten into the Soviet Union. But now we were going to do a joint concert in a stadium. And and he, I said, well, do you, all right, do you have it covered? You know, funded? And how much is it going to cost? He said, oh, half a million. I said, okay. And we did. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say the person to person as um, diplomacy is the method of peace. 
I put an awful lot of work into U.S. and Soviet peace in those days. I was going to see if I could go down the road of a, a couple of quotes uh, from your book, but also, again, philosophy. Um, you said you were really moved by a line in the, uh, by a movie, a Johnny Cash movie called Walk the Line, and he was in the studio, and the, the producer, you know, over the talk back, said to, to Johnny Cash, play this song the way you would if they could save the world. And you said you were really moved by that, that it could happen. The music you have could to actually have that feeling inside you. The stuff you're doing is that important. And then let it come out the way it comes out, wants to come out naturally. Yeah. Don't work in a structured way. Here is exactly the path I'll follow. It's got to be in the artist. Yeah. yeah. I think that's the best advice for young people I could ever take. Yeah. yeah. But I'm emotionally taken when I hear statements like that. Yeah. Like that. The prediction business is tough, obviously, right? Things are changing so quickly. To make predictions is it's most likely we won't get them right. There's a, a point in 78, 79 in, in USD where we're trying to look around the corner of what was next, but you really couldn't. I mean, you saw a few things, but there was a lot of things that were clear. How did you approach the idea of, of the predictions or what would you build, or were you just looking at what was right in front of you at the time? Well, around that time frame, might have been, um, it was a little bit later, we discovered the, the approach to the Macintosh. That you could have a computer that a screen was in two dimensions. You could look at something and point to it rather than have to manipulate the way over to it and memorize things. What a beautiful, simple world that would be. And we saw that one and said, we've got to bring this to the masses. And we're going fortunately, we jumped in and did it very poorly. You know, we jumped in too quickly when it wasn't quite affordable to build a good computer yet. But we, we really sacrificed a lot of our company because the world market grew 10 times and Microsoft got all their growth. And we just kept fighting, fighting to someday, someday make the Macintosh go. Yeah. yeah, the idea that you saw ARPANET, which was the internet. Oh, ARPANET, yes, the United States military set up a project to connect four un five universities at first. And by the time I discovered it, I think it was six universities. I could go on to, if you had a terminal at home that cost more than a car, or if you were smart enough to design your own working with your own TV set, for example, <laughs> you could call a number over by Stanford, one of the legs of the, the ARPANET had Stanford Research Institute, SRI. They had MIT, University, UC um, LA, UC San Diego, Santa Barbara, and Utah and some other school. You could see a list of schools that type in three and go to an MIT computer and play chess games and read files. My God, this was, they set up this network to explore. What if computers far away could be connected? That was the start of the internet. It was the inspiration eventually for the internet. Long, long in advance. This is before Apple. Ever envisioned that the computers that we have today would be connected this way from that? Could you ever predict that? Um, did you? I wasn't a predictor so much saying where is the world going. I don't like to be a long-term science fiction guy because I'm an engineer feet on the ground. I just said, I just said, I want this. Whatever this, oh my god, I want this superpower to reach computers across the country. Yeah. I wanted it. That's why I built it. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing as the computer. I wanted my own machine to solve my engineering problems at work without having to use their computer. And I wanted to write games. I wanted to play games. I mean, I developed games and hardware for Atari, so I was already there. Yeah. I think they say that's an important part, that uh, if you wait to get it perfect, it will never ship. It'll never be done. So it's better to just get it done and finish it, knowing it will improve it. But you know what? When you don't have a lot of people around you, it's easy to think out your mind and work on improvement, improvement, improvement. Getting very close to that 100% perfection will never equal it exactly. It's funny, about 38 years after the MP2, I woke up about six months ago. Oh my gosh, I figured out a way I could have saved one more chip. <laughs> <laughs> then I thought even further. But then, I, then I thought about five minutes later, my head was in that half asleep, half awake state. But five minutes later, I thought, oh my gosh, I had two shades of gray, 16 colors, but two of them were the identical gray. You know, kind of like a zero gray and a one gray. Oh my gosh, I could have made one of them lighter, one of them darker with oh, just two little dinky parts. The two little, you know, little one cent parts. And since things but then. So, yeah. <laughs> that really talks about the future of computers, too, right now. How do you foresee the future? And I say, kind of, you can look at the past. 
One of the things is all of the personal computers have been getting closer and closer to we humans, becoming more like a friend. Pull out your phone, ask a question, it talks back, just like a friend would. We're working in the human. They got more and more human. We live our way. We put effort into the products, software, development. We put huge amounts of effort in so that it works in the human ways rather than force of the human to manipulate and memorize all these computerish things and feel like I'm the slave, I'm not the master. And that's one, so that trend will have continued. And as these products get smaller, they'll get closer to it. It suggests wearables like watches or headphones, although I'm not um, still on the fence on that, whether that's going to be successful. It suggests also these that they're getting more human. Uh, like I, I described, I described we could never equal the human mind. A long time ago, Apple came out with a tablet called the Newton Message Pad. A lot of you here haven't heard of it, but it was a thing you could write with a spider, in handwriting even, and your own muscles, your own human muscles, it would know what you wrote. And that was beautiful. I loved taking all my notes on it. But the first day I had it, I was in the San Francisco airport with my kids flying to Disney World, and I got a phone call. So the very first thing I did, there's an open um, notepad at the front of it. I hand wrote a reminder to me, a reminder to Steve, saying, Sarah, dentist, Tuesday, 2 p.m. Just a reminder note. And I'm looking at, oh, there's a button called Assist. I wonder what it does. I clicked Assist. It noted what I had just typed. It opened the calendar. It put in Tuesday at 2 p.m. It put the word dentist. And it grabbed Sarah out of my contact list. And that changed my life forever. From then on, I only wanted a machine that understood the human speech, the human ideas, the human thinking that a machine would understand us. Now no, we've got things like Siri, we're talking to it, and we've replaced part of the brain where? Um, if you had a, a big question in the past, you would ask somebody smart, right? Well, now who do you ask? It starts with G-O, and it's not God. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, so we're getting better answers. It's like the computers have replaced a part of the brain, but we don't know how the brain is made. We don't know how to get to that, that conscious level. So that's probably, you know, I think that, that um, it's a scary thought. Well, you know, and the smartest people in the world, Stephen Hawking and, and uh, Trinity if you were alive. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, let's see, um, Elon Musk, who has the Tesla car and SpaceX. These people are coming out, the founders of Google, saying that the, very, the biggest danger ahead is artificial intelligence, because they can see how close we're getting. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's, it's scary if a machine can do all my thinking better. Why would I, and it's not like that. It's, it, if it comes my best friend and knows my heart and soul better than any other human, I don't need you again. <laughs> well, that's the flip side. It could either emulate or be a real tool yeah. to help. If you but say it, it needs that mentor relationship. That's what we're, we're building. It help us. We're going to be family. Yeah, and that's why I buy my dog twice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the trouble is that, um, yeah, it's, um, you know, funny, we can't turn a bit of it off. We can't shut down a single factory that manufactures things that we want to give up our lifestyle. And so in my mind, the, the machines won the battle 200 years ago. Because everything we build with them, every step we take with them, we can never go back to something before. You can't turn off the internet. You know, how would you get anything done in your life? You, know, you can't turn off your smartphone now to get out on them. We'll never sacrifice our lifestyle. So the machines are more important than all the things in some cases in a lot of ways. Well, no, we brought everyone down to here. I, I want to finish this on something really funny because I think this is what, what we thought. Uh, how excited we were to see you and have you come to, to the NAMM show. It's just such a, you have such a spirit of, of inquisitiveness, of humor, that life is, is always going to be something to enjoy. Pranks. I mean, have we kind of run the humor out a lot of our life now? I mean, you were a great prankster. What were some of your, your well, we more favorite? We don't, we, don't, we don't even allow a lot of humor because, like, like we used to have Easter eggs in, in uh, programs, you know, where if you type the right key sequences, you see pictures of the developers. And they do have Easter egg now on the Tesla automobile, I heard. Wow, and I'm glad, but at Apple, if you do that now, you are fired. <laughs> you know, kind of like you know, if you play a prank, you're, you're in a lot of trouble. Well, I mean, you know, to be. You know, to be fair, and you had a joke line, a, a one of the first dial eight hundred nine dial jokes. <laughs> first, first dial joke in the San Francisco area. Why? As a young engineer, I most of my biggest expense was my apartment and an answering machine in those days from the Monopoly phone company, AT and T. Didn't have any choices in the world. One answering machine. It was half again my apartment rental, but I believed in humor so much. I ran the first dial joke, and I had um, the most called single line number in the United States with no extensions. <laughs> 2,000 jokes a day would, would, would tell the little students calling in the Bay Area. 
I go, hello, thank you for dialing dialing Joe. <laughs> but I was kind of anonymous, like in chat rooms, when for a shy person who can't talk to real humans, I could talk to people this way, and I could take live calls and do it live too, and that's my first life ever. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I could make name up faster than you, and I did. <laughs> but I think it's the lesson there is that sometimes we take ourselves too seriously. Sometimes we take the world too seriously. Yes, all this is happening, but we got to have some. But there are different personalities. You know what? Your personality kind of settled in by the time you're about 20 and it doesn't change much in your life. So if you hadn't thought it out by the time you're 20, I love my young life. I want to stay young thinking forever. I want to enjoy music. I want to laugh at jokes. And, you know, it's probably not going to come to you. <laughs> I think the music industry is made up of a rest of development 20 year olds, which is perfect. And that's why I love music business. We don't all like that. That passion comes through. Yeah, and that's why I like it so much. And uh, for many years, I don't go to the big, huge concerts, you know, the big, hugely produced groups, and every, all the freaks around, and a lot of money goes into it. No, I like to go to the little 30 person music bars up to, you know, a couple hundred people, up to maybe 500, the medium sized mm -hmm. places at the largest. But I love the music business. Four great little ads, you know, and if you have one glass of wine, I'm not a wine drinker, but, for, but I'll drink one glass of wine. And sometimes you just get up there floating thinking, I am so lucky for everything I did in my life. It got me here tonight, and it's just a little group that you'll never even remember the name of, but you know, you just know you have that experience. It's good. I, 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 I like to Maybe it's a guy and a girl, maybe it's two guys, but they're kind of their cause, you know, they're kind of singing. But I love them. So when they're, maybe they're singing the songs and the music. This is such an important thing in their life. And the music is like a magic dust in my mind. I was thinking, it's a magic dust bringing like, love to people. <laughs> Let's wrap up. We're going to get over to the trade show floor. And could we have a warm thank you for your